great. Um, so hi, everyone. Hello. I'd like to welcome you all here today and joining us for our lightning talks exploring research in data science event. Um, thanks for joining us here today. I'm Ria, one of the VP event of events for Waterloo's Data Science Club. And today we have a great line of speakers here for you all. Um, we'll be hearing from a research professor who's here with us today, Mara Grossman, um, as well as two undergrad researchers and a grad school researcher as well. Um, before we start, I'd like to give you all a quick rundown of how the event will work. So each speaker will be giving, given their, um, giving their talk for about half their allotted time. And then we'll be proceeding to the question period for that particular speaker, um, where you'll all get a chance to ask them questions that you may have had while they were speaking or about anything else. Um, so to start off the event, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Maura Grossman, a research professor in the David R. Sheridan School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo, um, an adjunct professor at Odds Goods Hall Law School of York University, and an affiliate faculty member at the Vector Institute. Recently, Maura was named the Global Elite Thought Leader in Litigation by Who's Who Legal 2020. It's an honor to have Maura speak with us today, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to hear Maura speak. I know I am. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Maura. So I will literally try and hand it over to Maura by stop sharing my screen, and I will try and make you the host. Okay. Thank you so much, Ria, and thanks yeah, everybody no for having me. And I am host, so I should be able to share my screen. And okay, share. And let me uh, hold it. I'm going to move you guys out of the way. Okay. And whoops, let's get this full size. So you should be having it full size. All right. I'm going to talk about the path from here to there. Uh, this is me. Uh, I started out as a clinical psychologist and a hospital administrator in New York City. Uh, we'd have to have a few beers before I could tell you how I became a lawyer at a Manhattan law firm. And you can see me as a lawyer on the right. And I became what's called an e-discovery lawyer. And I'll talk to you about what that means. That led me to the University of Waterloo uh, as a research professor in the School of Computer Science. I also teach at Osgood Hall Law School and I do some work with the Vector Institute on AI, and I have my own law and consulting practice. I was then asked to be Director of Women in Computer Science at Waterloo, and then uh, I got a West Graham Faculty Fellowship, which is the work I'm going to talk to you about today. So that's me and how I got from there to here. The work I do, the research I do, is uh, with problems that involve finding substantially all of, of the documents in a big collection with the least possible effort. So when you do a Google search, you're not trying to find all, you're trying to find the answer to your question. You're only interested in one thing. My research focuses on finding everything. So what are the applications? Well, one is in what's called technology assisted review and e-discovery. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's something that lawyers do when they need to find all of the evidence in a case. Records curation, or it's sometimes called information governance is where the government has to make all of the public records public so that uh, people can see them. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about is screening for systematic review in evidence-based medicine. So where you have to find all the studies that have to do with COVID-19. And another task might be creating fully labeled data sets. So we have found everything related to you or related to me or related to uh, Justin Bieber or whoever else you want to find everything on. And many more, but those are a few examples. So here's the problem I dealt with as a lawyer when I was at my law firm in New York. I would collect 26 and a half million documents from the witnesses and all of the relevant data sources. And we would remove the irrelevant, the system files and the duplicates. And maybe we would apply some date restrictions if we were only interested in a specific time period. And we'd have 17.25 million documents left and we load them essentially in what's called a review platform or, or a database that allows you to search and review the documents. 
What we didn't know was that 64,406 of them, or three in a thousand, are documents that, that are what's called responsive to the production request. And in other words, they're relevant to the lawsuit. So we don't know this number and we don't know which documents. And our job as lawyers is to find all 64,406 or as close to that as we can. But reviewing, we don't wanna review all 17 million and that's gonna be very, very expensive. So we wanna review the least possible number it's typically in a short time frame, maybe a couple of months. And we have to be in a position to demonstrate both to the other side in the litigation and to the court that we've done a reasonable job. We've done a good job at this task. So what lawyers would do was come up with keywords. So uh, the same way you might put keywords into Google, if they had to find all of the documents concerning some drug on tumors and hamsters, they might come up with a search that looked something like this. The problem was it would only find 21% of the documents and 70% of the stuff that it brought back was junk. So it's like sticking your hand in a jelly bean jar and you're only interested in the red jelly beans, but most of your handful uh, has other color jelly beans. So the problem I was trying to figure out is how do I find as much as I can, but not a lot of junk. So that led me, because I'm a lawyer, I was, I was born, well, after being a psychologist, I was a lawyer working in a big law firm in Manhattan. I didn't know anything about computer science or data science. I'd never taken a course in this. But I figured this is a technical problem and there must be a technical solution. And if I can just find the data scientists and the computer scientists, they'll help me figure this out. So I went to something in Washington, D.C. that's called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they're the U.S. government folks who measure things. And between 2016, 2006, 2011, and then again in 2015 and 16, they were doing some competitions, pulling together vendors, government people, computer scientists, data scientists, lawyers, and they all came together to try to solve the same problem I was. How do you find the few needles in these massive haystacks? So um, I learned about supervised machine learning and it's not something I knew about as a lawyer. And this was a process for taking a huge vat of 20 million documents and prioritizing them or ranking them or categorizing them from most likely to be responsive to least likely to be responsive. In other words, good evidence, bad evidence. And by having a lawyer look at a small subset of the collection and then those judgments are applied to the remaining millions and millions of documents. And I called this technology assisted review. So in 2011, I did a study with Gordon Cormack, who's a professor here at Waterloo, uh, where we showed that this machine learning uh, technology uh, that you folks are learning about and using could find the evidence in a legal case better than lawyers could. So if we use this technology, it would find many more documents, make fewer mistakes, and be much more efficient than if lawyers reviewed all of the documents. So what we found when we compared Waterloo, which was the tool, the technology assisted review tool, and H5 was another tool, with either law students, third year law students or professionals, if you look at the bottom line, Waterloo found 76.7% .7 of the documents, the humans found 59.3%. So the technology found more documents. If we look at the number of errors, uh, the Waterloo made many less errors than the humans. And if we looked at F1, which is an average of the two, the technology beat the, um, the human. So this was the first study ever done that showed that machine learning could beat lawyers at finding the evidence in the case. And this um, 
led to, well, it led to my becoming fairly famous, but um, there was a lot of controversy uh, about this because lots of lawyers just would not believe that uh, there was technology that could do this task. So for those of you who are a little more visual, we're trying to get to the gold star in the upper right-hand corner. The blue diamonds are the technology, the red diamonds are the humans, and you can see that by and large, the blue diamonds are closer to the gold star than the red diamonds, and except for one of them. So when you have a hammer, when you have really good technology, and I had met, he's now my fiance, uh, but at the time he was just my collaborator from Waterloo, uh, he had a spam filter and he made, he tweaked his spam filter so that it could help me in the legal field find evidence. So instead of spam and not spam, we used it to find good evidence and, and, and not evidence. But then we had this tool and we said, well, I, we wonder if there are more problems that we can solve with this tool. So um, during the, when Tim Kaine was uh, governor of Virginia and he was running for vice president in the United States, the Virginia State Archive wanted to make his email available for uh, people to review the same way Hillary Clinton had made her uh, or some of her email available. So we had 400,000 documents that had been reviewed by humans uh, uh, from Tim Kaine's emails. And we wanted to see, could our technology do better than the archivists who reviewed Tim Kaine's email? So we repeated the same study in 2017, uh, six years later, and we found that our technology was pretty much even with finding documents. Our technology made many fewer mistakes and on our, uh, on our average, that our technology beat uh, the archivist of uh, the senior state archivist of Virginia with much less effort. So we decide, okay, we, there gotta be more tasks we can do with our hammer. So we decided to get into the area of health. And what a systematic review is, is the following. You want to find everything that's been done or researched about a particular problem and you have millions and millions of studies out there and you wanna find all the studies on a particular thing so that you can do a meta-analysis. You can look for trends uh, rather than just looking at one study because maybe one study is not statistically significant, but if you have four studies that all show a small effect, you may decide that the data suggests otherwise. So we went to something called CLAY, uh, which was, a European group that did the same thing as the National Institute in Washington, DC. They brought together people from uh, all over the world, uh, technologists, lawyers, doctors, government people to try to find all of the research studies. So Gordon and I take our tool. We are the three bottom roles and we get 95%, 96%, 95% of the uh, research papers. And you can see everybody else does worse than us. So uh, for those of you who are visual, perfect is the top green line. And we are the next three, Grossman and Cormac are the next three which beat everybody else at finding these studies. So along comes COVID and some people at St. Michael's Hospital uh, in Toronto, one of them was a former w Waterloo student who had heard of us and heard of our work. And they reached out to us on behalf of the Canadian Frailty Network, Health Canada and the World Health Organization. And they said, we have a problem. We have 32 million documents from something called Medline, which is all of the medical studies that have been published since 1966. We have an archive called Med Archive, and we have another one called Bio Archive. And these are about 45,000 documents that are studies people have put on the web, but they're not published in a journal. 
We have the United States clinicaltrials.gov, which are about 355,000 of them uh, that are um, trials that have been done, again, have not been published. And then we have European, Chinese, and Japanese articles also. Uh, and we have two weeks, and we need to find all of the ones that have to do with either treatments for COVID or uh, things that can be done in nursing homes uh, to prevent elderly from getting sick. And they said, can you, can you help us? Because there's no way we can review 35 million documents in two weeks. And we said, sure, we can help. We have a hammer. Uh, so I am going to take you uh, to a machine learning tool that we use to do this. Whoops, let me see if I can find it. Um, it should have been behind my slides. Hmm. Ah, here, uh, here it is. Let me see, share screen. And where is it, Cal? Okay. So you should be seeing something that says Autotar. So this is about 35 million uh, documents in here. And say I want to find all, I want to learn about treatments for COVID because I want to give the doctors all of the studies so they can decide what works and what doesn't. So say I put a search term in here for hydroxychloroquine because President Trump said it works. So I do a search and the first study that comes up says is about hydroxychloroquine in dermatology. So that's not relevant. I'm not interested in it. It's not what the doctors are looking for. So I am gonna mark that not relevant. And in the second it took uh, for the next document to come up, this machine learning algorithm has re-ranked 35 million documents from most likely to least likely to be responsive. And I look at this successful desensitization for the eruption, it looks not relevant. And we find another one that's not, that doesn't look like it's a relevant study. And we would continue to do this. Uh, and here, this one we can't tell. So we could click on the link, go straight to the PubMed and see, does it have anything to do with our disease, no, it does not appear to. It looks like lupus and other things. So we would go back and we would say it's not relevant. And we would continue to do this until it started to find uh, documents. And it's not finding any yet, but uh, which I don't know why, but let's try a new search and let's spell, let's see, maybe I spelled it wrong, hydroxychloroquine. Let's spell it this way and see what happens. Uh, enter. Preeclampsia is not relevant for COVID-19, bingo. So here we found a study for COVID-19 and we're gonna tell it relevant. And now it says Brug auf hydroxychloroquine. And I really don't know if that's relevant. So I could right click and I can translate this from German into English and uh, I could see if it was uh, relevant or not. And we will open it up and we will see actually COVID-19 in the midst of hydroxychloroquine. So obviously that's relevant. Uh, we're gonna go back and mark that relevant. And here it seems to think something in the metadata makes this document relevant. We could click on it, we could look and we could see it's in French. It's about COVID-19. And we were able to do this, uh, as you can see how quickly it learned, and we were able to find out of 35 million documents, all of the documents that had been published on treatments for COVID-19. So these doctors could uh, look at them all and um, make decisions about whether they were uh, relevant or not. So let me bring you back to my slides. So, now you've seen how we did it. Uh, this led to a lot of press. Uh, we got a tremendous amount of press on this. Uh, it led to three medical publications. And 
uh, lots of collaborations with other people who now want to work with us because they think our technology can help them. So Lowy's Dietz is a very, very rare uh, genetic disorder and they want to find all of the literature on this particular disease and they've asked us to help them uh, search all of the literature to find those, uh, those papers. Uh, so um, we, we thank our sponsors who uh, help pay for this research. Uh, but that's the kind of thing uh, that I have been uh, doing and I'm happy to answer questions, but it was kind of cool to be able to uh, do something valuable uh, for the world with COVID-19. We were able to see very quickly uh, from just doing this work that hydroxychloroquine uh, was useless. Uh, we knew that before, uh, or at least while uh, President Trump was out there telling the world you know, how good it was and how they should be taking it. And we were able to find all of the studies in a day or two and, and tell people that, um, that no, in fact, that, that didn't appear to be the case when you looked at all of the literature. So let me stop here and ask if anybody has any questions about uh, this work. Um, before that, Maura, thank you so much for your talk. It was extremely interesting. I definitely learned a lot. Um, just in terms of logistics, um, could you please make me host again so I can admit a few people who are waiting? Absolutely, um, absolutely. And in the meantime, okay. you could go ahead with answering questions. So if you guys do have any questions for Maura, please feel free to write that down in the chat or you can message more individually and she can also answer your questions anonymously too if, you, if you're more comfortable that way. Okay, so there you are more make host. Yes, you should be host now. Great, yes, thank you so much. Okay, so back to the questions. So I uh, see, can you put more than one search term, maybe separated? You don't even have to put commas. You can put as many search terms as you want in there. Uh, there's no syntax. So uh, it will look for all of them. It will look for the, the first algorithm is called BM25. It's a relevance ranking algorithm. It's much like Google. And it will look for the most interesting combination of whatever terms uh, you put in. So if you put in treatment of COVID, uh, you could put in new pneumonia, uh, you could put in COVID SARS, whatever you wanted, you could, you could put in hundreds of terms. I just started very simply um, uh, with that. And what you could do, we used uh, doctors who gave us some of the terms to use because we didn't know them all. For this Lowy's Dietz disease, uh, we know the names of the six genes that are involved. So we're going to train the algorithm, the machine learning, using the names of the six genes that they told us about, and then separate things that are about those genes that are about this disease and, and things that are not about this disease. But the magic is how quickly uh, you can do this. I didn't tell you this, but a typical um, systematic review in medicine takes over a year, and, and we did our piece in six days. We also bought, for those of you who are more technically inclined, uh, with one of my grants, I bought two servers. Uh, they each had 80, 80 processors, uh, a terabyte of, of RAM, and a petabyte of disk. Uh, and that's how we were able to download all of this data off the internet and, and process it so quickly. Any other questions? Well, feel free to reach out to me if uh, any of what I talked about interests you. Uh, I'm not a hardcore computer scientist. I work with a hardcore computer scientist. Uh, but I find uh, a lot of what I teach is in the cross between um, technology and law. And I teach ethics for data scientists. So uh, if you take, if you are in the MD SAI program or uh, in the other uh, computer science master's program in data science, you will eventually uh, have me uh, as a professor. Uh, we didn't have to do any specific uh, change in format. We did not index this data. In, in law, you would index 
the data and we would change the format of the documents. Uh, but here, uh, all we were doing were uh, searching things that were already on websites. Um, the one course that I teach undergrad, I occasionally let a few undergrads into my grad course. I, I, uh, I teach CS, I think it was 489 uh, that, I, that I let a handful of uh, uh, undergrads into, but it's a course on artificial intelligence, law, ethics, and policy. And, and I, I do save a couple of spots for undergrads. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to talk to you. So uh, again, any questions or anything? Um, oh, if integrated fully, how much time could this save lawyers? 50 times the efficiency, 50 times. You can review 2% of the document collection and do better uh, than, than the lawyers reviewing 100% at, at 50 times the savings. So that, that's sort of game changing. Uh, of course, that ended up in me being called the most dangerous lawyer in North America because um, I, I uh, lost a lot of people a lot of money who were making millions of dollars um, reviewing these documents by hand. So thank you. I'll hand it back to uh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, really appreciate that you were here with us today and thank you for sharing whatever work you do. It, it really does mean a lot that you took some time to be with us today. My um, and I'm sure everyone did enjoy that based on the questions and we do have a pretty big turnout as well. Um, but that's it for a question period with Maura. Um, once again, thank you all. Thank you, Mara. Um, now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Nayef Ahmed. I just want to make sure, Nayef, if you're here with us. Yes. Hi, Nayef. Hello. Can How's you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we good, can see good. you. Can you find? I love the background, especially because oh, I'm thank the same campus. So <laughs> that's definitely a lot nicer to see. Um, but yeah, so I'm really looking forward to introduce Nayef Ahmed, who's a fourth year mechatronics engineering student at the University of Waterloo. Um, over his academic career, he has interned at several tech companies from Microsoft, Lyft Level 5, and Facebook. He worked on various engineering and applied research problems within computer vision, natural language processing, and self-driving and self-driving space. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but I'd like to hand it over to Nayef now so he can tell you more about the cool work that he did in the space. So over to you, Nayef. You should be able to share your screen. Please do sure. let me know if you can't. Yeah, thanks, Ria. Let me just... Yeah, um, I think I need to give permission to Zoom to... Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm gonna have to restart. <laughs> it says... Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll be right back. Uh, give me 30 seconds. Yeah, it's totally fine. Sorry for that delay, everyone. We are all experiencing technical difficulties because this is pretty new to all of us. So, sorry about that. I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, That's great. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay. I think I should build the share now. Um, yes. That. Great. Cool. Yep. You can see your screen. Perfect. Great. So yeah, let's just get started. Um, so, firstly, who am I? I think Ria did a great job. Yeah, I'm a fourth year mechatronics student at U Waterloo. Um, and some of my past experiences include um, working at various tech companies uh, where I've gotten, in, like, for example, like uh, recently I was at PyTorch NLP uh, at Facebook AI. Last summer I was uh, also at Facebook doing computer vision work. And then uh, more recently this winter, I was working on perception for self driving cars at Lyft Level 5. And before that, I was working on um, AR and cloud computing at Microsoft and back in 2018. So today I just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of my summer 2019 project um, when I was interning on the computer vision team at Facebook AI. Uh, you can feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask questions. Um, I'll also leave a couple of minutes at the end for, for, for questions. Um, I also don't have the Zoom um, app in front of me. So if you guys do type in something, just like let me know because I won't be able to see it. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So yeah, the first thing, so to introduce the project, 
Um, when I joined, uh, this was my first time doing any sort of computer vision work, uh, especially in deep learning. I've never really done any uh, like real uh, world experience. I've, I guess I've had a lot of project experience and a lot of like um, uh, club experience, like so from like design teams, but this was my first time in an industry setting working on computer vision. So I was like super excited. Uh, and the, the main project was to apply um, existing face detection and tracking solutions that exist at Facebook to videos at scale. So um, I guess the team collected 600,000 uh, video data set of like scenes, objects and actions that they wanted to open source for the research community um, to, do, uh, to improve uh, their, their models on, on videos. However, because these uh, videos were collected from public uh, like groups and public uh, like um, uh, news feeds, uh, you needed to remove things like uh, faces, license plates, and credit card info. These are called personally identifiable information or PII. And the other thing to, to note is that each video in this data set was approximately 10 to 30 seconds long. And there's like 600,000 of them. So that's, it's a really, really large like data set. Like, uh, uh, and processing it could take um, like a couple of days, depending on how much computation power you threw at it. So yeah, some of the challenges, I guess, for the project was that we needed to have a robust pipeline that can blur uh, relevant classes in every single frame of a video. And the reason for that is that uh, for videos, if you miss even one frame, uh, people's personal info could be compromised. Uh, and in this case, uh, since I was focusing on faces, um, if you paused on a specific frame of a video and someone's face wasn't blurred out, then like you kind of, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of trying to blur out um, people's faces in the rest of the video. So yeah, it had to be uh, robust and uh, very accurate. Uh, so a naive approach to do this would be to run detection models offline on every frame. What I mean by offline is that um, you could just, because we already have this data set, we don't have any real time requirements for the system. So you can just uh, run detection frame by frame on every single video and then blur out whatever bounding boxes your detector returns. Um, the only issue with that is that it's very computationally expensive. As I mentioned, the data set is huge and um, having to read on this multiple times, uh, it takes up a lot of resources that could go towards um, other projects that people are working on at Facebook. So that wasn't the ideal solution. Um, another issue is that detection isn't as effective when objects are included. So uh, I guess here's an example of this. Uh, this is actually like a tracker running on uh, a input bounding box, which is in blue. And the purple is basically uh, the tracker's bounding box saying like, where does the tracker think the face is? Um, so a tracker, uh, or I guess tracking is usually more robust to occlusions. So you can see like, even if half the face is covered, you can kind of tell where the face is. Whereas if a detector ran on this uh, same image, uh, it would have no idea where the face was, uh, depending on which detector is used. Um, so yeah, I'll just quickly describe like the approach that I kind of took to um, design this whole pipeline. So um, the uh, I ended up going with a hybrid detection and tracking approach. So the idea is you run detection on the first frame uh, every two seconds, and that two seconds is arbitrary. It's a tunable value. You can be like can be five seconds, it could be one second, it could be half a second. Um, so you basically run the detector on the first frame um, every two seconds. So if a video is 10 seconds long, uh, you would basically get the uh, zero second frame, the second, the frame at the second second, and then the fourth second, six seconds, so on, um, and apply a detection model on it to uh, output all of the bounding boxes for where the detector thinks faces are in that video uh, or in that frame. And then in the intermediate frame, so from uh, say, if, uh, the video is 30 frames per second, and we have two seconds, right? So that's a total of 60 frames. The first frame you run detection on. So the following 59 frames, you give the tracker the um, detection bounding boxes, and it would basically track those bounding boxes across the rest of the uh, two seconds of video. And then lastly, blur out all of those bounding boxes after the detection and tracking uh, part is complete. So step one and uh, two can run in parallel. Uh, since the video can be broken up into smaller two second chunks. So, so as I said, a 10 second video can be broken up into five chunks, like two seconds, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds. And then you can kind of run these in parallel and then I'll put all of the resulting bounding boxes on a frame by frame basis and then passing it, pass that into the blurring module to blur that 
uh, all of the uh, faces out in, in the entire video and then stitch that video back together. Uh, the other important part to know here is that the pipeline is very modular, which means that it's agnostic to the detector and the tracker that you're using. Um, which And that just means that uh, in the future, if you have improvements uh, to your detector or to your tracker, um, it would be very easy to swap in a new detector or a new tracker uh, without having to make too many changes to the entire pipeline. Um, here's kind of like a visual example of what that architecture looked like. Uh, it's not super important to get into the nitty gritty, but it just, uh, like there's like a decoder that decodes uh, every single frame, passes it into this detector plugin, which detects faces, and then passes uh, this plugin, the face detection plugin will send those as detection messages to the tracking plugin, plugin, which then kind of stores everything in this database. And then later on, our um, blurring module will like kind of query for these uh, results and then uh, get the correct video and then basically blur, blur out those bounding boxes um, in, in the corresponding video. So I won't spend too much time on this, but this is kind of what that looked like. Um, yeah, and then so basically after the first pass, uh, we noticed that there were many failure cases for the face detector. Um, and the first step was to visualize these failure cases and then discuss the results with the research scientists that created the detector uh, that I was using. Um, and I ended up learning that the detector is very outdated. Uh, it's like, I think it was like 20 years old. So it's not uh, even based on any of the recent deep learning advances that have been made in the computer vision field. Um, and the reason that this was okay to, uh, for Facebook is that uh, usually Facebook uh, deals with images like where people are looking directly at the camera. But when you're working with videos where people might be moving around and their face might be occluded and stuff, it's a lot harder to use this type of a detector to accurately detect faces. So that ended up leading to me investigating some off the shelf detectors, like which performed very well in popular benchmarks such as Wetterface and FTTP. And one of the ones that st stuck out was the dual shot face detector, so D DSFD. Um, which was something we wanted to use for future iterations of our uh, detection and tracking pipeline. So how do we basically evaluate the detector and the tracker? So you would usually, um, you have an evaluation or a test data set to kind of, to see how uh, well your, um, I guess, model or your end-to-end -end pipeline is performing um, in, 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 uh, in the overall, I guess, data set. So since we didn't have any, um, uh, annotated data sets with faces, I ended up having to lead some annotation efforts to create an evaluation set of 20,000 images uh, using something called Halo, which is like an in-house annotation tool. Um, and the way that this was done is we would basically try to find videos that have a high likelihood of having faces in them and then sample every one second within the video. Um, so if you remember earlier, I was saying we would do detection every two seconds and the inter intermediate frames we would run tracking. So by sampling videos um, every one second, you can kind of measure your tracker performance and your detector performance, because you know that the uh, frames you're sampling at the zero second, the second uh, second, the fourth second and so on would correspond to the uh, performance of the detector. And then the ones that you're sampling at odd numbers, so one second, three second, five second, would help you evaluate the performance of the tracker. And this would kind of let you determine that, um, is it your detector that's kind of causing issues uh, or is it your tracker that's causing issues? So um, this evaluation set can also be used in the future to compare uh, the current detector we're using to other off the shelf methods. Um, yeah, and then, so some of the final results we ended up with. Uh, so the end-to-end -end pipeline was run on the annotated evaluation set as well as the entire data set. Um, and then we ended up getting a raw precision of 85%, we call it 47%, uh, which, uh, and I think we were, um, we basically wanted to optimize for precision. Uh, however, uh, usually, um, like usually the metric you care about is uh, F1 score, which is uh, kind of combines precision and recall um, in that metric. So to basically improve the recall, we ended up thresholding out faces that were 24 by 16 pixels or less because those faces are so small that even humans can't make them out. So it's kind of unreasonable to expect your model to uh, kind of detect that accurately. So when you thresholded those out from the annotated data set, our uh, precision improved like slightly to 86%, but the recall improved significantly to 59%. Um, 
Um, and yeah, so I have a few examples of what that kind of looked like. Um, let's hopefully this plays. Yeah, I think you guys can see that. So these are like some successful examples of uh, the whole pipeline working well, completely blurring out the faces so that you can't tell uh, who's behind, I guess, uh, or who, whose face this is. But there were some, uh, there were a lot of, I guess, uh, failure cases as well. So one example would be here. Um, this is a detection failure because from uh, the zeroth frame, the detector didn't detect the face. So then the tracker has nothing to track over the next two seconds. Um, so by improving the detector, you can automatically improve uh, some of these cases. And then similarly, you can see a tracking failure here. So basically sometimes there's a quick abrupt uh, scene change and then uh, in the camera position, uh, so like the camera position changes like really quickly and the tracker can't keep up with that because it thinks the, um, it thinks the face was uh, elsewhere and then now it like kind of jumped. So you kind of need to improve the tracker here or run uh, the detector densely on every single frame to kind of improve these type of cases. And then, yeah, there were some kind of takeaways from this. Um, you can try testing some of the, like this entire pipeline with other off-the-shelf detectors to see if they get better detection results. And then you can also look into using a more robust tracker. So OpenCV has some built-in trackers um, and I kind of explored a few of those when I was trying to figure out which tracker to go with. Um, and the BDN flow tracker was one of the ones I ended up going with because um, it kind of worked well for the type of videos we had. Uh, but in the future, you can also use a more complex tracker. And, but this isn't a priority since the detector seems to be the main cause of failures. So yeah, that was kind of my project. Uh, some of the key takeaways, I guess I got from uh, like my first like ML type of experience was that um, very little time on the job was actually spent on training models. Um, most of the time was spent on data collection efforts, on setting up the training pipeline and looking up a lot of code from Stack Overflow. Um, yeah, so then yeah, I think that kind of concludes my presentation. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thanks, Naya. That was very interesting and definitely learned a lot. Um, the Stack Overflow part is relatable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I see one question already. If you guys want to ask questions anonymously, you can message Naya or myself. Um, and yeah, I'll just hand it over to Naya for questions. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I can't seem to see the messages. I can, I can I read it out mind. for you if that's helpful. I think I found it. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. Cool. Um, so thanks for the great talk. Hard to get into AI without a graduate degree, but from experience, is that true? Would you recommend us to get a master's PhD? Um, yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So I guess. Um, so the one I went over was my first kind of ML yeah, experience. And afterwards I had a couple more and every time I was surrounded by PhDs, like everyone was either like an ex professor at Columbia or Stanford, or like you basically have a lot of imposter syndrome when you're like working with like super smart people in the field. Um, I won't lie. I think having a master's or a PhD does help because like ML is a really fast moving field. And there's like a lot of things going on um, very quickly in the field. So having those higher degrees does help, especially if you want to do research in the field um, and that credit accreditation that, oh yeah, you have a PhD from X university. It does, it does help to take you more seriously, like help people take you more seriously. At the same time, that doesn't mean you can't be successful in the field. Um, for me, a lot of what I learned was self-taught. I don't think Waterloo had the courses or I wasn't able to take the courses early enough to be able to get into the things I was interested in. Uh, but there's like with the internet, there's like Stanford Open Courseware, there's MIT Open Courseware. Um, so a lot of relevant courses for um, doing research in these fields are already available to us. Uh, so it's just like a matter of like taking some time out to do those. Um, but at the same time, I think if you want to be a uh, researcher in the field and are really interested in the academic side of things, it doesn't hurt to have that master's or PhD. But if you know, like for me, I enjoy the applied side of things. So like more so applied research um, where you kind of are caught up with the uh, state of the art, but you're not necessarily researching or creating new novel methods. You're kind of applying the latest research to existing products. That definitely doesn't require a PhD or a master's, but yeah. 
Yeah, I do know that Stephen Fang, who we have as our closing speaker, he will be, he's actually a grad student at Carnegie Mellon. He'll be speaking more to that. So maybe that might be helpful for whoever asked. Um, but you did say that you did learn a lot of this by yourself. I'm just going to add in here and because we do have one more question. Do you have any specific resources off the top of your mind that you do remember that were helpful with you learning more about ML? Yeah, so for the, uh, that specific co-op where I was doing a lot of computer vision work, I think Stanford CS231N course is like a really good course. It's taught by Fei-Fei Li. And one of her grad students, I was actually working with him at Facebook and I was like, I just took your course like a couple months ago and I'm working beside you. It's kind of <laughs> insane. Uh, so that, that was really cool. Um, that's a good one. Fast.ai has a bunch of good deep learning courses. Um, I think MIT has a good intro to ML1, so does Stanford. So yeah, just like literally Google will be a rest friend there. Um, yeah, I, I think I can answer one more maybe or one or two more. Yeah, I don't know how much we time have, we like, have. We have three more questions just to as okay. it's totally fine. Yeah, I think we're fine on time. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. I think so. Did you, okay, so Ryan was like, do you prefer to work in self driving cars or this project, which is more interesting and challenging? Um, I don't think the domain matters as much, like what you're applying it to, like the uh, concepts are the same. Like if you're working on computer vision at Facebook versus Lyft, or uh, if you're applying it for anonymization purposes versus like detecting other cars purposes. Like, at the end of the day, most of the concepts are the same. Um, I would say self-driving is an interesting space. Uh, it's really relevant to robotics, which is kind of what my background is in. So I found that pretty interesting, um, but I, I think that's a lot based on per personal preference. Um, yeah, technical differences between a detector and a tracker. Why can't you just run detector on every second? Would the computational cost be that much different? So yes, um, usually a detector is on the magnitude of like 500 times slower than a tracker. The, the reason for that is a detector would basically run a CNN uh, to create bounding boxes of whatever classes you care about. A tracker basically takes bounding boxes um, that have already been generated and kind of, um, depending on the type of tracker, we'll try to see how has that object moved from the one frame to another frame, which is a lot easier to do based on, uh, uh, I guess, the tracking approach you take. But in general, tracker is significantly faster than a detector. So it would, uh, so 500 times, so say, uh, I guess, anonymizing the entire uh, data set took one day. Running only detections on it would could take 500 days. Like, uh, just as an example, obviously, it wouldn't take that much because you can parallelize a lot of things. But um, yeah, so you basically want to reduce computational cost as much as possible when you're kind of working with such big data sets. Um, um, we have another question here um, mm -hmm. about opportunities at Waterloo. Um, so what opportunities at Waterloo would you recommend for getting into ML work or research? And it says Andrej Karpathy. I don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, Andrej Karpathy <laughs> is the director of AI at Tesla. Um, oh, okay. also, he was also a um, grad student of Fei Fei Li's the CS231N course that I was talking about. Okay, um, okay, okay. I see. What opportunities at Waterloo? I mean, co-ops are great, especially because like our co-op program is like pretty amazing. Where to work at really cool companies. Um, but uh, to get, get into ML worker research, I would say like good things would be side projects, like uh, just get into doing some side projects with a couple of your friends, learn, um, kind of start applying some of the things you learn in these open courses that I was talking about, online courses I was talking about. Um, that kind of shows that you have a passion for the field. Uh, another thing you could do is a URA. Um, I know a lot of professors um, are open to mentoring and teaching younger students about um, AI and ML, especially. And then that's like really helpful guidance when you're starting out. So I would say URAs, co-ops, uh, co-ops come later usually after you get some personal projects and, and research experience. Yep. Um, yeah. Another question was. Would you face, uh, would, um, say face image recognition detection can be easily translatable to other image detection, such as in medical diagnosis? Yeah, so I, I would say the detectors, I mean, all of them work on the same concepts, right? Depending on uh, the model architecture used, that end of the day, it's basically, are you training your model or your detector on faces? Are you training it on, I don't know, like malignant tumors? Like it, it depends on what your training data set is, but usually the, um, especially if you're talking about it from a deep learning aspect, it's it doesn't matter um, what the class you're trying to identify is. The, core principles are the same, get really good training data, and then have a good um, model architecture uh, for what you're trying to do. Um, so 
regardless of what you're trying to classify, it should be easily transferable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think unless do you have any questions that have been messaged to you? There was yeah one more private one. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So when do you allocate yourself time to self study these courses concepts on your own during study terms? Uh, that's a good question. It's pretty hard. I don't like you already have a lot to <laughs> do with like co-op plus school plus like interviewing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes like uh, for me especially like. Uh, like my grades have definitely suffered when I was like, you know, doing a lot of personal projects or doing um, like more design teamwork and stuff. But I would say it's worth it. Like grades aren't everything. Uh, unless you know for sure you want to do grad school, then grades are very important. But other times you can let your grades suffer a bit if it means you're enriching your education um, in other ways. And I think like if, if your end goal is to work at, um, I don't know, some sort of company on some cool like ML type of work, like where you're doing cool ML engineering work or applied research work, then I would say, like for me, it would be a worthwhile trade-off to have, like, you know, drop my GPA by a couple of points, but, you know, get more experience and and, uh, and, and learn more about a field that I'm interested in. Yeah, Does that make sense? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Nayef. I think those are all the questions that we can take for today. Um, Nayef did, did list his email down there. So if you guys do have any questions, I'm sure you'll be fine with people emailing you, hopefully. Yep. Um, I don't want to false advertise, but um, thank Sounds you, Nayef. We definitely learned a lot and um, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed his talk as well. But now moving on to our second undergraduate um, research talk today, we have Sarth Frey. Um, just wanted to make sure that Sarth is in the chat. Nayef, yeah, I think you can stop sharing your screen. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, okay, Sarth. How's it going? Perfect. Hey, not too bad. Uh, let me just figure out if I can share my screen here. Yeah, uh, for sure. But my um, friends all, in the meantime... always tease me for not being able to use technology, even though I built it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. But um, in the meantime, I think I'll just uh, give a brief introduction um, sure. about yourself. But Sarth is a fourth year student, a CS student at UW, um, with experience in data analytics, machine learning, and data engineering. He spent his most recent co-op at Databricks creating an open source project for doing deep learning at scale and contributed to TensorFlow, um, in addition to adding a feature in Apache Spark. In the past, he worked on multi-metric black box Bayesian optimization, that was quite a mouthful, um, while at SigOpt, and before that, in, on AI infrastructure and NVIDIA. We're super excited to have Sarth speak with us today. So without further ado, I'd love to hand it over to Sarth. Cool. Uh, looks like I just figured out how to share. So there we go. All right. Uh, can you see this? Yep, we can see it. All right, great. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm a fourth year student uh, CS at, at Waterloo. Um, I'm going to spend this lighting talk uh, just talking about my, my most recent co-op. Uh, and that was at the company Databricks. Um, specifically uh, a project I did, did on the uh, ML team there. Um, so yeah, as I said, fourth year student on uh, NCS. Um, so my most recent experience was doing machine learning at Databricks. Um, and then before that um, was doing multi-metric black box optimization at a small startup called SigOpt. Um, and you know, to unpack what that means, uh, the multi-metric basically just means you're optimizing on more than one variable. So um, kind of the prototypical example there is like, say you're a financial analyst um, and you're, you have a stock portfolio and you're trying to optimize both, both the, uh, uh, the return of a stock and also minimize the risk of that stock at the same time. So you care about the, both the, uh, the variance and the uh, expected value of, of some random variable, for example. Um, and then the black box here just means you don't know the function that you're trying to optimize on. So it's not, it's not just put out, put out for, you, for, you, for you to do some math with. Um, and so, yeah, that's all that means. Uh, it's, it's very wordy though. Um, and then before that, uh, I was doing AI infrastructure at NVIDIA. Um, so going on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Databricks first as a, as a company, as a whole. Um, so to begin with, Databricks was founded uh, kind of out of a research team at Berkeley. And uh, that re research team was focused on kind of the big data space uh, in the late 2000s. Um, and they were working on this technology that would soon become known as Apache Spark. Uh, and so for those who don't know, um, if you're familiar with Hadoop, Apache Spark is very similar, but um, it keeps all of the data in memory um, rather than constantly putting it on disk. 
Um, or if you if you use uh, Python, if you've used the uh, library pandas, uh, pandas is basically a library in Python for keeping a bunch of tabular data in memory. Um, you can imagine what would happen if your data, you know, went to a terabyte or a petabyte, right? You wouldn't really be able to store that on your laptop anymore. Um, so Apache Spark is kind of similar to Pandas. You can think of it that way, except uh, it stores the data and splits the data onto multiple different computers uh, in a distributed system. Um, so Apache Spark is basically, you know, big data technology for doing some computation on data uh, at scale, pretty much, um, using a distributed system or a cluster, if you will. Uh, and then the last piece of that is uh, the, the people at Databricks, rather than trying to uh, kind of build this technology and then sell it uh, and license it out or something like that, uh, instead, they just decide to open source it. Uh, and that ended up being a really good idea for them because uh, you know people from outside of Databricks kept adding onto that technology. And now Apache Spark has become a really big technology and many people at many different companies rely on that. And uh, then instead, Databricks kind of built a platform on top of Apache Spark. Um, and so, you know, they started off that way where they used Apache Spark uh, in their product, but now they've kind of expanded into other things. Um, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, okay, cool. So uh, next, I just want to briefly touch on deep learning. Um, so for those who don't know, deep learning subs uh, is a subset of machine learning. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, some of the tools people use to, to accomplish or to do deep learning. Um, a couple of them are TensorFlow, uh, which is heavily sponsored by Google. Uh, the other is PyTorch, which is sponsored by Facebook. And, and, you know, there's a couple other ones that are kind of growing right now too. Um, one of them from Apache actually. Um, and the, the point I want to touch on is Databricks has a pretty heavy stake in, in deep learning. And the reason is, is, you know, they started off in the late 2000s being really into big data, right? So they didn't care really what people were doing with their data. They just wanted to let people or give people tools to amass a large amount of it. Um, and that's really all they were focused on. Um, but then in the recent years, you know, they've realized um, like many others that, well, okay, once you have a lot of data, uh, usually you want to do something with it. Um, and Databricks realized that like half their users um, were using that data to do some form of machine learning. Um, and so in the last, say, five years, Databricks has really put a heavy emphasis on building out systems to let people uh, do machine learning better, easier, more efficiently, um, just kind of building on that, on that space. Um, and so that's how I was on the machine learning team at Databricks. Um, so now I'll describe the problem that uh, I was trying to solve when I was there. Um, so, you know, oftentimes when you do deep learning, you're handling a large amount of data. Like, uh, you know, for example, Nayef said uh, that when he was doing his project, you know, it could have taken 500 days to train something versus 100 days. So you're really talking in terms of a large scale here um, when you're working on a problem like this. And so, um, and, you know, as he mentioned himself, you, you know, you can use a distributed computing uh, system in order to speed things up. Uh, obviously, you want to reduce the amount of data that you need um, to, to solve your problem. Um, but at a certain point, it still might be too large. And so, rather than say, you know, put all the work on a, on a single computer um, and have it take 100 days, um, maybe split up that work into chunks, give each chunk to say 10 computers, and then each computer um, will do the work and maybe it'll take uh, 10 days instead, right? Um, and so, uh, so that was one problem, right? So how do we accomplish this distributed computing for deep learning? Uh, the other problem was that, you know, there were already solutions to let people do this. Um, to let people who are, say, maybe someone's using TensorFlow on their laptop, right? They build some deep learning model. Um, the, you know, TensorFlow has code to let them scale that onto a distributed system. But the problem was, is that the code was very complicated uh, when scaling, when doing that scaling. So for example, um, maybe they'd write their code on their laptop and it would be 100 lines. Um, but when scaling it to a large system, uh, you know, they might have 1,000 lines. And those extra 900 lines we're probably uh, taking 10 times as long to write as those first 100 lines um, because it's a completely different skill set to, to do distributed system work. Um, and so there was very just a large complication process there. Um, the, the next thing is that this, is, this process was very error prone um, because as you can imagine, uh, you know, you, you start getting this mingling of, of distributed system networking code with your machine learning code. Um, you know, the, the machine learning person just wants to deal with machine learning. The engineer just wants to do with, deal with engineering. Um, and so you have these people who are constantly trying to deal with this kind of 
mess pretty much, right? And so it's very easy to, to let, let errors come in. And, and really at the end of the day, um, you have this uh, tightly coupling uh, or really tight coupling between these two different things that should really just be separate, right? Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of problems in the way that this is done currently. A lot of it stems from the fact that these tools like TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, weren't originally built as system uh, to, be, to be done to build systems. They were originally built um, as research tools um, and they're very good at that, but they, they were never really designed fundam fundamentally to be, to be used as um, something for building systems, right? Um, so the, I'll just kind of point out the solution that we ended up coming to, but it, <laughs> as many things go, it wasn't as simple as that, right? Um, but the solution was basically a program that takes a non-distributed TensorFlow program. And so what that means is, is say you, you build a model on your laptop, um, the code for that. So this program that we built will take your code, the simple code that builds a model on your laptop and it'll automatically distribute it um, on a Spark cluster. So the idea is you literally just don't have to worry about dealing with any of this distributed system stuff, anything to scale it. You write the program as if you're just gonna run it on a single computer, maybe on a single GPU. Um, and this, this library or this system we're building will just take care of the rest. So you don't need to do anything extra. So that was the goal. Um, and we accomplished that goal. So you only need like a couple extra lines of code uh, to scale it. Um, and that couple extra lines of code is just um, providing kind of your wants pretty much. So how many GPUs do you wanna run it on? Um, things like that pretty much. Um, this work was made much easier by GPU scheduling support, which was added to Spark, because as you can imagine, um, you need to know, say, if you have 10 computers you want to train this on, um, you need to know, say, there's three GPUs on each computer, um, say there's six on one, but three on the other, you need to know how, how you should be distributing that work, because it's not always homogenous. Um, and so we contributed this project to TensorFlow, so you can see a link there, and so you can feel free to visit that. Uh, it's in the ecosystem there. Um, uh, but just to dive into some of the problems we encountered in this work, um, you know, this, this work was definitely uh, had, a, had a heavy research aspect to it because there are many unknowns. Um, the, it, it was very simple in terms of implementation, uh, but it was difficult in terms of figuring out how we wanted to do it um, because no one had done it before for a reason. Uh, there were many unknowns, for example, um, Spark does not have a really good way of having communication between different computers in that cluster. Um, as you can imagine, when you're doing distributed computing uh, with, with deep learning, you constantly need to share information between computers. Um, I'll give you one example. So uh, in deep learning, there's the concept of a gradient, right? Um, you're doing some optimization on an objective function. Um, now, when you distribute this work, uh, usually the, the efficiency comes from the fact that each of the different computers can maybe handle a different piece of data and compute a gradient. Um, but, you know, as they compute their own gradients, they're going to be out of sync. One computer is going to be computing its own gradient from its own computer or from its own piece of data. Another computer is going to be computing its, a different gradient from a different piece of data. And so they need to share these gradients. Um, and the way they do that is, is by actually um, sending information over the network to, to one another. And so there needs to be communication. Um, Spark did not have good support for that. So we kind of hit a, hit a, I guess, like a roadblock, if you will, during this project where we realized that, you know, with the capabilities of Spark, it was literally impossible to do that. Um, so that's how this kind of adding a feature to Spark came about, where the idea is you can have um, kind of a barrier execution in Spark. And then during that execution, you can have the computers in the distributed uh, system or the cluster actually pass messages to each other. Um, and, and that kind of uses the idea of barriers from concurrency, if you're familiar with that. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the project. Um, uh, a little bit as well, just an extra slide here on tips for getting experiences like these, because I know many people are interested. Um, I think for me, the one, one big thing has been just to be really interested and, uh, and persistent. And uh, that kind of goes along with what Nayef said as well. Um, and then also, you know, working on your resume is very important. So you know, UWDSC uh, runs resume critiques. I definitely encourage you to go to, to, go to them. And, uh, you know, in terms of solving the chicken and egg problem of like uh, the, the job requires these skills or the, the research position requires these skills in order to get it. Um, but I need the research position or the job in order to get those skills. You know, there's the whole chicken and egg problem. I think the nice thing about many of these things is you can actually get these skills um, on your own in your own time. Um, you know, there's, as Nive said, there's, there's great tutorials out there online. Um, you know, at, at Waterloo, there's great 
great resources with great professors that you can do your arrays with. Um, you know, the internet's a really good resource. And even things that require large scale, like infrastructure, um, there's a lot of cloud technologies out there now, right? Like AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Azure. And so even large scale infrastructure, you can start to play around with, with tools like that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, my email's there, so you can reach out to me. Um, and yeah, so any questions? Um, yeah, and thank you so much for that talk, Sarth. That I really appreciate that and definitely learned a lot. Um, and I'm sure everyone else really enjoyed it too. But if anyone has any questions, you can message Sarth individually or myself, um, or you can also just message the chat publicly. Uh, how do I see the chat when I'm sharing? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, you can you can stop sharing if you'd like. Oh, okay, That's cool. More uh, yeah. All right. I think um, just waiting for a few questions, unless you have any. Oh yeah, I got a private one. Okay, so okay. would you say that distributed distributive deep learning somewhat mimics the process of transfer learning? Um, that's a good question. So I guess transfer learning is is where you would. Train, train your model on some, some task and then kind of transfer the, that learning onto another task. Um, let me think about that for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I never really thought about that way, but in a way it is, you know, because you, you maybe not exactly transfer learning, but you are learning on it from a different piece of data, even though it's for the same, same task. But, but I, I see what you're getting at, right? So transfer learning is where you learn from a different task and you apply that to a new task. Um, in distributed training, you're not changing the task per se, but you are changing the data. So two different computers um, with two different pieces of work, right? The work will be learning from a different piece of data. So for example, um, an image recognition, uh, one computer might be busy working on how to detect a car, whereas the other one might be uh, learning on how to detect like a hot dog or something, right? Um, and so even though your task is detecting between cars and hot dogs, and you're still, you're still um, maintaining the same task, um, you are sharing learnings between the different uh, agents involved. And so, yeah, that's really an interesting way to look at it. I didn't think of that, but yeah, I guess it is, it is kind of mimicking it in that way, for sure. Any other questions? Um, I can't remember if you shared your email in your last slide. Did you... uh, I did, yeah. So I can actually yeah. put it in the chat yeah. and then that way everyone can see it. Uh, yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, they can always, if it's okay with you, um, email you yeah, and sure. maybe you can talk to it there. All right, there we go. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, feel free to email me with uh, any questions, anyone. Um, my email is completely open. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for um, sparing some time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today, uh, Sarth. It really does mean a lot and we definitely learned a lot. And while reading your introduction, it was just a mouthful. So um, I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you have so much more experiences to share with people if they're um, interested and they wanna ask you more questions. Yeah, for sure. Thank yeah. you, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Sarah, once again. Um, now I'd like to introduce our closing um, speaker for tonight, who is Stephen Fang. And Stephen is a first year graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, before I introduce Stephen, I'd wanna make sure that Stephen's here with us today and that he's in the chat. Um, I mean, in the call. Yep. Yeah, hi, hey, Stephen. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Yeah, hey, yeah, pretty good. I can't what about you? you? <laughs> um, it's good. It's good. It's a Monday, which is always the best day of the week. Am I right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, no problem. Um, I know you were, you're um, a Waterloo alum, so it really means a lot to have someone who's been to Waterloo to kind of talk about where you can go in the future and what you're currently mm -hmm. doing um, relating to data science. So um, just to introduce Stephen, as I said, he is a first year graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, previously, he was an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier University. He has a strong passion for data science and machine learning, particularly natural language processing. He has extensive research experience and has published at major conferences. Um, and I hope I say these correctly. Please do um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the conferences such as EMN, 
E M N L P and A A A I or Triple AI. Um, his present interests are mainly in language generation, data augmentation, and dialogue agents. I'd like to hand it off to Stephen to talk more about his extensive work in data science and research. All right, sounds good. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, um, no problem. Let me try sharing. <clears throat> yep, can you guys see my screen? Or? Awesome. Yeah. So um, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, today I'll be discussing briefly about my experiences and advice in regards to undergrad research and grad school preparation. I'll try to keep the presentation pretty short. Um, I just prepared it right now, so I'm not actually sure how long it is. But um, So basically, I'll be going through some of these topics that you can see on this slide right here. Um, so I'll start with a brief background about me. So as, as she stated, I'm a first year grad student at CMU. I'm currently at the Masters of Language Technologies program, which is a research masters, um, which is designed to transition into a PhD afterwards. Uh, previously, I was an undergrad at U Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier studying mathematics and business double degree, um, which is not a typical background you think of uh, when you think of somebody going into machine learning research. Um, so I had to do a lot of transitioning um, to basically get up to speed with machine learning and um, establish my profile for grad school applications. In terms of research interests, my main focus is in the area of NLP or natural language processing. Specifically, I'm interested in language generation, data augmentation techniques for NLP, uh, as well as dialect agents and semantics. And some other hobbies I enjoy, um, gaming, piano, table tennis. And you can find out more about me as well as my contact information on my website. Um, so I guess um, getting into things. So if you're interested in doing undergrad research, the one question I always get is, um, you know, how do I gain the background knowledge or experience required? And I'd say that it's more of a natural thing that you develop over time. Um, it's easy at the beginning to feel like, feel very rushed, like, oh, I need to learn all of this complicated machine learning theory and math stuff. But really, um, you don't have to do any of that. You learn mainly by doing and by getting involved in projects, research, and so forth. But in terms of some resources for some decent background knowledge, I recommend um, taking courses here at Waterloo. So some CS machine and machine learning and math courses, which I'll get into more of on the next slide. Um, you can always learn about specific things you're interested in by, you know, watching YouTube videos, reading blog posts and articles. There are also very good online courses. So Andrew Ng's uh, Stanford Machine Learning course on Coursera is a staple. Uh, Pascal Poupart has also uploaded his CS480, which is the machine learning course at Waterloo, lectures onto YouTube. And those are very good. So I recommend checking those out. Uh, these are all linked on my slides. Um, and then, you know, getting involved in Kaggle competitions. And once you're a bit more familiar, maybe reading some more advanced research papers. Uh, so papers are typically uploaded to the site called Archive. So you can go on that site and search for what you're interested in. So in terms of specific courses, firstly, a disclaimer, I was not even a computer science major. Um, so say what I, uh, take what I say here with a grain of salt and do your own research as well on the courses. Uh, in computer science, I find the most important thing will be algorithms, as well as all of the more basic courses uh, that teach you the fundamentals. You don't need anything um, really more advanced on the CS side for the most part, uh, unless you're doing very heavy engineering or applied type of work. Um, there's a lot of math. So my current um, grad courses, it's basically like 10% programming and 90% math, and it's a bunch of difficult statistics, calculus, and so forth. Um, so I would definitely recommend those courses. So the ones I took at Waterloo that I recommend are you know, the basic Calc courses, 137, and so forth. Stats 230 and 231 are very fundamental and basic. Uh, you will have to pretty much know them if you want to do any type of research type of machine learning. Um, 330, 333, so forth. Um, so basic optimization will also be helpful. And I never actually took the machine learning courses here, but I heard CS480, um, especially if you can get into the section taught by Pascal. CS486, I would recommend Jesse Hoey. Um, so that's artificial intelligence. And then Staff441 is a more um, math type of machine learning course, I believe. Um, so anybody can feel free to add more course recommendations or correct me if I'm mistaken about any of these. Um, 
So the next thing is how do you narrow down an area of interest? So machine learning, uh, data science and AI in general are extremely broad. There's a lot of different areas. Um, some examples include you know, computer vision, robotics, reinforcement learning, NLP, as well as more machine learning theory. So how do you usually narrow this down is by, um, again, first learning the basics um, through your experiences on the web, reading papers, watching YouTube videos, talking to people, getting involved in projects and research. You'll come to figure out what exactly you enjoy. So the reason I chose NLP is because I enjoy it a lot. I also find there's a lot of potential for it as there's the current um, state of the art. Well, with GPT-3, it's gotten better, but um, current state of the art, especially language generation models are not very good. They don't actually have a very strong understanding of what exactly they're saying or what you say to them, for example. Um, so there's a lot of potential there. And I was very interested in NLP because I've always been interested in language. Um, and my first research project in undergrad with Professor Jesse Hoey was on NLP. So just by chance, you know, it was the area I was interested in. And then I realized, you know, I really enjoy this. Um, so I'd say go with the flow and see what you end up enjoying. <clears throat> so next question I get is, you know, how do I get involved in, in undergrad research? Firstly, um, it's about choosing a good professor in the lab. So I kind of broken this down into different criteria depending on its importance. So the most important things are that there's a supportive and welcoming environment um, in their lab basically. And that the professor as well as their students have a great personality and compatibility with you. And especially as an undergrad, you're going to need more handholding or guidance. So you'd wanna make sure they actually pay attention to you. Um, I, I know a lot of undergrads who work with professors uh, they go in, you know, nobody's helping them with anything. They end up wasting a few months of time, don't get anything out of it. So you definitely do not want that to happen to you. Um, next would be them having aligned research interests. Although at the beginning, like I said, you might not have narrowed down what exactly you're interested in yet, but you'll probably have a general idea. So it might be good to find somebody, a professor or lab that aligns more with your interests. Although as um, an undergrad, especially someone beginning research, I would recommend keeping your options more open and being more open-minded. Um, you'd also want somebody who is active and enthusiastic so they can really guide you and hopefully you know, help you publish some papers or stuff like that. So one site that's useful is Google Scholar. If you sort by day, you can see their number of publications um, more recently. So the more publications doesn't necessarily mean better research because again, quality versus quantity. But you can get a sense for you know how active they are. If they haven't published in years, then it's probably not somebody you'd want to work with. Um, and then there's the less important things, but things you might want to consider, especially if you want to apply for grad school. The first is, are they famous or well known? So this is very difficult to even know at the beginning because you have no idea. So one thing again is look at sites like Google Scholar. You can see there's this statistic called H index. Typically, the higher it is. Uh, it means the more established they are in the field, um, the more citations and papers they have. But again, you don't want this to be one of your primary considerations. This is something for the, um, to consider on the side. Um, the other thing would be, are they well connected to academia and industry? So again, this will be useful for job search later, um, grad school applications and so forth. And um, so what I recommend is if you really want to do in-depth undergrad research and you're very serious about it, contact some of these professor students beforehand, both the undergrad students that have worked with them and the grad students to get to know, you know, how they are, you know, um, do they actually help you and so forth. And when you actually email professors, I typically recommend moderate length. You don't want to be too short. Uh, you don't want to be too long and bore them to death either. Um, and, you know, emphasize your past experience, your research interests, specific projects of theirs that interest you. And most importantly, you want to be enthusiastic and show that you're actually interested. So now there's two types of undergrad research that you can get involved with, um, other than going into industry like um, Naya, um, uh, who went to like, for example, Facebook AI and so forth. Uh, but in terms of sticking to schools such as Waterloo, there's URA, which is part-time research during your study term. Um, it's pretty easy to get, but it's 
much less involved, you usually don't get much out of it, but it's good for trying out research at the beginning. So I would recommend if you're not entirely sure you wanna do research, try out a URA or two during your study terms. Um, you usually wanna contact professors beforehand, like one or two months before the term begins. And there's a, a link there to some CS URAs, but that's not an exhaustive list. You should um, search for all the CS faculty and see which ones you might be interested in and get in contact with them. Uh, many professors uh, might be picky. They might have already chosen students and so forth. So you wanna keep your options open and email not just one or two, um, but more of them. And then there's the NSERC USRA, which is full-time research. It basically like replaces a co-op term. So this is more competitive to get in. Um, it's much more involved and can result in strong research output because you're pretty much working full-time for many months. Um, and it's good to really see if you enjoy research and to narrow down your interests and you will need to apply early. So typically I recommend, you know, try a URA or two. And then later on, if you really want to get involved in research and possibly apply to grad school later, maybe do a term or two of this full-time USRAs, which is what I ended up doing. All right. So I'll just highlight some of the professors that I worked with. So firstly is Professor Jesse Hoey. Um, so he leads the Competition Health Informatics Lab here at Waterloo. Um, he focuses on various aspects of AI, um, mostly on healthcare related applications, effective processes, a bit of HCI. And when I was working with him, um, he did some NLP, but I'm not sure if he's still working on that. So you'll have to check if you wish to work with him. But I owe a lot to him. He's a great mentor. Um, yeah, great guy <laughs> uh, in general. Um, I worked with him as well as one of his uh, research assistants in his lab, Aaron Lee. Um, so they definitely helped me a lot to be able to develop my research experience as well as skills. Second is Professor Pascal Poupart. So he's also, he's a machine learning professor here, teaches courses like CS480. He's also uh, works at Boreas AI and is affiliated with the Vector Institute. So he focuses more on the typical machine learning stuff, reinforcement learning, NLP and so forth. Very smart guy. Um, also owe him a lot for his help and assistance with everything. Um, so if you want to, um, contact these professors, uh, feel free. They are pretty great people um, to work with. So now in terms of research itself, so one of the major goals of research is to get these, what are called publications and attend conferences. So publications are basically papers outlining the research you did. They discuss the impact and novelty of the research, contain extensive experience, you know, the methodology, in which models you used, the experiments, evaluation, so forth. But it's very difficult to write a strong and convincing paper that can grab readers' attention. And it's usually a bonus to actually publish, especially for undergrads. Um, so don't feel too stressed out to publish, but if you can publish a paper or two during undergrad, it's, it'll definitely be great, uh, both for your experience and when you apply for grad school. Um, you usually submit publications to either journals or conferences. In computer science, we usually submit to conferences and they're usually ordered by their impacts. Uh, so you can check that link there. Uh, major deadlines once every few months. However, less impactful and prestigious conference have more frequent deadlines. Um, and then if your paper is accepted there, basically what happens is you'll usually travel there to give a poster or oral presentation, and you'll usually get funding from your professor, the department, or the school. So again, this is one of the outcomes that you can try to aim for um, when you do research, but it's by no means necessary. But it's great experience, and it will definitely impact um, whether it's a job search or grad school applications or whatever. Um, so here's just some of the conferences I attended. So the first one was EMNLP. This is one of the top NLP conferences last year in Hong Kong. So thankfully that was before the coronavirus. So I got to go. Um, you can see, you know, I presented a poster there. Met some amazing people. Actually got to have lunch with Christopher Manning as well as some of his former students. So if you don't know, Christopher Manning is the director of the Stanford AI Lab, as well as um, one of the top NLP professors and researchers in the world. So again, conferences are great to um, have fun, you know, eat some good food, travel around and um, meet some amazing people. But unfortunately these days with the coronavirus, a lot of conferences are virtual, um, which invalidates a lot of what I said, but hopefully, you know, um, things get better soon. Um, 
So my work at EMNLP was with Professor Hoey, um, as well as Aaron Lee, uh, titled Keep Calm and Switch On, Preserving Sentiment and Fluency in Semantic Text Exchange. So we define this task called semantic text exchange, which basically manipulates an input piece of text to fit the semantic context of what we call a replacement entity, which is a new word or phrase, which we wish to insert into the original piece of text. So at the bottom, you see a diagram with an example of our pipeline Smarty. So on the top right, you can see the original piece of text about how the weather is sunny um, and how the replacement entity is rainy. And on the top right, you can see that desired an example of output text where it's converted the entire piece of text to fit you know, the word rainy. So rather than just rainy replacing sunny, um, other words such as sunscreen have been replaced with umbrella and so forth. So the other uh, conference I got to go, with, go to was AAAI in New York in February. So thankfully this was also before the massive uh, wave of coronavirus and all the quarantine happened. Um, so I got to present a research posted there as well as um, give my first ever conference talk. And I was very lucky that the room actually filled up. There were many people who came to listen. Um, so my work for that was called Aloha, Artificial Learning of Human Attributes for Dialogue Agents. Also with Professor Hoey, Aaron, as well as some others um, who were working in the lab at that time. So basically we define human level attributes or HLAs, which are based on tropes, characteristics of fictional characters representative of their profile and identity um, in order to personalize dialogue agents. So you'll see an example in the bottom left where Shell, Sheldon Cooper has these very specific tropes like he's an um, insufferable genius, neat freak, and so forth. So he has over 300, showing he's a very complex character. And what we can do is we can map hundreds or thousands of these characters to a character space, where distances between characters depend on how much they differ in terms of their HLAs or tropes. So you can see an example of this space, which has been dimensionality reduced to um, 2D on the bottom right-hand side. Um, so what we can do is we can use the space and associated dialogue of these characters to learn a character or personality specific language model. So if we choose any character or point on this space, we can use the dialogue of nearby surrounding characters while avoiding the dialogue of characters further away to train this character specific language model. Um, so I gave a talk, which you can check at the YouTube link. Um, so more recently at CMU, um, I've been getting more involved in text generation as well as data augmentation. So one of my recent publications is for um, Deep Learning Inside and Out workshop at EMNLP 2020, uh, which will be happening in a couple of weeks actually, but unfortunately it's virtual. So it's called Gen Aug, Data Augmentation for Fine-Tuning Text Generators. So we actually investigate data augmentation techniques uh, for the sole purpose of improving performance on text generation. For example, augmenting training examples for models such as GPD-2 uh, to train on. So when they train on these augmented examples plus the original examples, we desire that their performance will improve. So the output of text will be more fluent, more diverse and more human-like. Um, so it's very complicated. Um, actually all of these measures of um, how well generated text does and so forth. And you can find more at uh, the link for our paper. And you can see some examples of our augmentation techniques on the slide, uh, character level synthetic noise, replacing with synonyms, hyponyms, and semantic text exchange, which is the work I presented at EML NLP last year, which we also tried for data augmentation. So we found certain techniques worked very well um, on the Yelp reviews data set for fine tuning GPT-2. And that's the amount of augmentation leads to improved quality of generated text up to a peak at around three times the original amount of training data and then tapers off afterwards, which we believe might be because our augmentation methods um, modify the text to a limited degree. So when you, aug when you use too many augmented examples, it can actually lead to overfitting um, because it's training on uh, similar data to the original training examples. Uh, right, so that will be the second major part of my presentation, which is more focused on grad school preparation. So the first question is yes or no to grad school. So just like Nav said, I think it depends. If you're more into you know, applied stuff, uh, more software engineering and so forth, I don't think it's necessary. But if you're focusing on machine learning, especially research aspects of it, 
it's pretty much necessary nowadays, especially since the field is so popular and it's extremely competitive and only getting more competitive. Um, all these buzzwords going around like neural networks, machine learning, you have, you know, um, even high schoolers now who are like, you know, oh, I want to get into machine learning, go to Stanford for PhD and so forth. Um, so yeah, um, masters at the least will help land machine learning engineering and applied roles. Either course-based or research masters are typically okay for applied roles. If you want to focus on more research roles like research engineering and especially research scientist roles in industry or of course professorship in academia, then a PhD is pretty much um, I would say necessary these days unless you are a crazy exception for some reason. Um, so the first thing you want to consider are which schools and programs to apply to. So you want to apply to a mixture of programs. Um, so firstly, different locations, uh, depending on you know where you might want to go or where you're okay with going to for at least a few years. Um, also different locations have different things like Canada you know, has more research-based masters, the US has more course-based masters and so forth. One thing you definitely want to do is apply for different ranks of schools. You want a list of safety schools, which you'll be satisfied getting into, but they aren't your top choices. You want some go schools, which um, you're aiming for. And then you want some dream schools like uh, Stanford, MIT, CMU, um, which you know, you're just shooting your shot there. Um, it's definitely good to shoot your shot um, and try for everything, but you wanna make sure to apply to different rank schools. Um, don't make the mistake I did, which was only applying to the top ranked schools. It wasn't actually a mistake because I actually ended up getting into some of them, but um, it, it's not a safe thing to do basically. Um, in terms of master's versus PhD, so Canada master's is almost always recommended because there's usually research masters, whether it's for computer science, um, data science or whatever. Um, for example, at Waterloo and UFT, uh, these are typically recommended um, because there's more flexibility. You're not just getting yourself into a five-year PhD. It's a two-year master's with a very high transition rate typically to a PhD. So you can see if you like it, uh, you can move later to a different school for PhD or go into industry after. For the USA, um, I would also recommend masters if there's a research masters. So CMU has some research masters programs, which I'll get into on the next slide. So these are funded and focused on research. Uh, which is good, but they are very rare in the US. So the third thing to debate about is course-based versus research-based masters. So course-based masters program, um, your goal is to go into industry basically. Um, it's self-funded, so you'll be paying quite a lot out of pocket, especially for those more um, top US schools like Stanford and CMU. And there's very limited time to do research. You'll, it's just like undergrad, you'll be taking four or five courses a term. And the point is to do all of those courses uh, to learn the content those courses are teaching you and then go apply it in industry after. Whereas research-based masters is similar to the first two years of a PhD. Um, uh, research, usually they have decently high transition rates to a PhD after, um, and you'll be more suited for the PhD after, as well as for any sort of research roles in the industry. Um, so factors to consider in terms of the school other than location and prestige. Um, location, okay, well, location prestige. Um, professors is actually one of the most important. So especially for research-based masters and PhD, you'll basically be working with a professor who is your advisor for up to five to six years, at least for the PhD. So again, just like those factors I said for the choosing undergrad professor to work with, uh, most of those factors also apply here. You want a lab that has a good culture and is supportive. You want a professor who spends some time on you, who's a nice person, um, whose research interests uh, generally at least align with yours and so forth. And the overall culture of the school you want, um, something that fits with you. So CMU, I think fits kind of my personality and my competitive type of personality um, because CMU is kind of like Waterloo, uh, but they're not just competitive in terms of finding jobs and internships, but also for research. So you'll be surrounded by uh, very strong individuals and there's quite a lot of competition there. Um, some people can't handle it, but I find it drives me to um, work harder and become better. So 
Um, yeah, like I said, but the most important thing are the professors themselves. So again, I recommend contacting the grad students beforehand. And prestige is a secondary consideration, um, but it is useful for connections and name, especially if you want to become a professor later. Um, the connections in academia are pretty important. Um, if you graduate from like Stanford, MIT, CMU, uh, your chance of landing faculty positions at top schools like that is higher, at least studies show that. Um, so you can use ranking sites like that US News one I posted, but huge disclaimer, take these with a grain of salt and these rankings should not determine um, which schools you apply to and which schools are actually good for you. Um, so just some programs at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so our School of Computer Science has many different departments, machine learning, robotics, software, and language technologies, which is the department I'm in. And there are many programs. So I'll focus specifically on some of the popular master's ones. So there's the one I'm in, MLT, which is a research-based master's focused on NLP. There's masters of robotics, multiple different types of them, which they also have a research one, uh, research-based robotics masters. So if you're interested in robotics um, and research, uh, consider applying to that master's program. Um, there's also some course-based programs, masters of machine learning and computer science, as well as the masters of computational data science. So in terms of what grad schools look for, when you're applying, there's kind of a few major factors. Uh, these are kind of ordered from least important to most important. Uh, so I'll start off with the GRE, which is kind of like the SAT. It's this test you have to take, but it's becoming less and less important as many schools are dropping the GRE requirement. Um, however, if any programs you're applying to at the time you apply or think of applying to require it, it's better to take it earlier rather than later as you can also try multiple times. The three major components, quantitative, which is like math. This is the most important for computer science, machine learning. You wanna aim for as high as possible. It's more simple high school level math, but there are some tricky, it's more tricky logic-based questions. It's kind of like easier versions of the math contest type of questions, I guess. Um, there's a written component, which I think is more important for PhD as well as research-based roles, um, research-based masters, I mean. And then there's a verbal component, which is like vocabulary, reading comprehension. So I found that the most annoying. You have to spend weeks or months memorizing, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 words, just like the SAT. And I've listed some practice material at the bottom. So I guess the next most important thing would be courses and GPA. So one common question is courses versus GPA, which should I focus on? I would say the GPA should be your focus, especially for computer science and machine learning um, grad school applications because those programs get so many applications that I don't believe they have the time to go through everybody's individual transcript and check, you know, their individual courses. Um, so they mainly look at the GPA as a filter. Typically for GPA, I'd say 3.9 is more than sufficient and 3.8 is probably good enough. Um, for our U Waterloo undergrad here, yeah, in Canada, we use percentages. So I would say aim for 85% and higher. If you can, 90% or higher, but I don't think it has a significant boost to your application. However, while GPA, I'd say, is more important overall, courses are still important. You want to take relevant courses that relate to your grad studies to show um, the grad committee people that you, know, you, you have the necessary background knowledge and that you're able to do well on um, the courses related to what you want to study in grad school. So just an example, if you're going to take CS480 versus history, uh, of course, CS480, but if you're going to take the stupidly hard stats course, which is a medium level stats course that is still useful, definitely the latter. You want most of your time to be focused on the other aspects of your application, especially research, which is by far the most important. Um, so speaking of research, um, you want strong research experience that demonstrates you have the potential to do great research, ability to think outside of the box, work well with other people in research and so forth. One underrated aspect of research is communication. A large portion of research after you finish all your experiments and coding is to write the paper and present it, like I said, uh, publications and conferences. So you want strong written and oral communication skills. And again, like I said, a bonus is publications, especially when applying to grad programs. It is becoming less of a bonus and more mandatory these days because of the amount of people applying and the amount of undergrads and masters applying to PhD programs with at least one uh, publication is increasing. 
it's difficult, stressful, and challenging, especially at the start when you don't have experience with it. Uh, it also requires seeing a research project through from the start to finish and then writing a strong paper that presents the research well. So, um, so I already talked about conferences versus journals. Uh, major conferences have lower acceptance rates, but stronger prestige, and they'll look better on your applications, but you're at a risk. Um, you, there's a trade-off. If you submit your papers to these major conferences, um, it's a lower chance of getting in um, compared to submitting it to a less prestigious conference. So you want to balance that. And you want to talk to your advisor who will have a better idea of you know, what are the chances um, based on your project and your paper. Um, and it's important to be aware of conference submission deadlines, which I've linked there. And if you want to talk, uh, learn more about the publication process, definitely talk to me because I have a lot of experience with this. And research experience also leads to strong recommendation letters and connections, which is actually by far the number one most important thing, which I'll talk about in a bit. So recommendation letters, you want at least two, usually three. Pretty much all programs I apply to require three. You want one extremely strong one from your main research advisor and preferably a secondary strong one, which also um, talks very highly of you. The third one is usually more supplementary. For example, you can ask a professor you took a course with or an employer or manager you worked with during co-op. Usually at least, at least two of the three should come from academic sources versus industry. Um, and this is arguably the most important part of grad school applications. Uh, so you want to really establish good relationships with your recommendation letter writers and your professors and make sure you, um, they see, see good things um, relating to you and say good things about you in the recommendation letters. So one bonus that's actually quite important these days, which sucks and is usually out of your control, is how well known and respected the letter writers are. So like I said, their H index and how well known they are in the field um, can have an impact. Um, even though I argue that it should have a, a negligible impact, um, I find that it's actually very important. Um, so one other thing is the statement of purpose, which is kind of like a one to two pages describing your prior research experience, research interests, and future research directions you want to pursue. So this is a very important chance to discuss your fit for the school labs and professors. Um, typically, you want to focus a bit more on the future research aspects um, versus the prior research, but you kind of want to balance it out. For course-based masters, you probably want to focus a bit more on past work experience and coursework as well. And you would want others to review your statement of purpose. And you can find some examples online. Um, so in terms of uh, this, okay, so I think it's getting late. Um, <laughs> I've talked much more than I thought. So I'm going to skip some of the less important slides. Uh, so there's also an interview process. Um, if you pass the first round of filtering. And in terms of final uh, comments, I just want to say that it's extremely competitive these days, especially for CS, even more so for machine learning and especially competitive areas like NLP. It's basically a crapshoot, a lot of lottery luck and so forth involved. So you shouldn't let the application process define you. I've known extremely strong and well-suited individuals for research who did not get into most of the programs they applied to. I know ones who were had less experience, but um, got in. Um, they probably also had a lot of strong aspects of them, but you know, there's probably aspects of luck involved that are out of your control. So, you know, if you get in, you're not necessarily the best. And if you don't get in, it doesn't mean you're worse than people who do. So that's kind of my final takeaway message. And thanks for listening to my presentation. So feel free to contact me if you have any more questions or just want to chat. So I've linked my personal website, uh, Twitter, email, and LinkedIn. So feel free to get in touch with me. And sorry, I spoke <laughs> for pretty long, so. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem, Stephen. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your talk. I think that was um, a really informative talk on grad school. And I'm sure a lot of people here did have questions about that um, or might've been interested in that process. So thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, if anyone has any questions for Stephen, I think we can take about two or three questions. I want to say, Matt, because we are over time. Please do share them in the chat or um, message Stephen individually or myself. I see we do have a question here um, asking if there's a reason why you chose MLT instead of um, instead of a PhD in CMU. Is it e just is it because it's easier to get into? Right. Okay. So firstly, so yeah, um, I'm not sure if again. So you guys can, whoever's organizing this can leave, but I can maybe stay a bit longer to answer more questions. Um, I'm pretty sure if I leave the meeting, then the meeting would end. 
Oh, but, I see. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. But it, it's, oh. it's, it's fine. Okay, so MLT instead of PhD. Right, so there's a couple different reasons. Um, so MLT mainly, it's a research-based master's with a decently high transition rate to PhD. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good way to, you know, really see if you really want to continue on to PhD after. And there's a bit more flexibility because it's pretty much the first two years of a PhD. But afterwards, you get the option of, you know, continuing on at CMU, um, leaving for another grad program, leaving to industry and so forth. So there's, it's a lot more flexible. Secondly, it, it is less competitive. Um, I don't think I actually got into the PhD program at CMU, um, but I got into this program. Um, so yeah, it is less competitive, but I'd say it's just as good, if not better than directly getting to the PhD because there's more flexibility. Um, what tools, um, oh yeah, I can yeah. read the comments. Yeah, um, totally fine. Uh, what tools compute do you use to implement your research? Does the scale of data require distributed training? Right, so in terms of tools that I use, um, so I have access to a lot of GPUs and stuff um, at Carnegie Mellon. And when I was at Waterloo, I had access to Jesse Hoey and Pascal Pupart's um, servers. So those contain lots of GPUs, especially my current CMU ones. Um, so you can pretty much train almost anything other than maybe GPT-3 or something, but um, required distributed training. Right, so in terms of a lot of the more uh, computationally intensive tasks, such as language generation, yeah, you'll have to train over multiple days as well as using um, batching and paralyzing for uh, the use of multiple GPUs and so forth. Um, one thing I recommend is Google Collab is pretty good. They offer free GPUs and now there's a pro version, which is only like $10 a month. And it gives you access typically to like a V100 and so forth, which is very generous. So um, could you share the slides? Yeah, I, I sh I'll share the slides. Maybe we can post it on the event page or in the okay. uh, Facebook group or something yeah, afterwards. Yeah, sounds good. Um, you can switch host to keep the meeting. Yeah, um, maybe we can fine. try that afterwards. It, yeah, it's um, fine. <laughs> if I may also ask, how did you get a publication with so s CMU so soon? Right, so I started working with CMU grad students before I started there. I'm um, actually since like April, April or May. So I started end of August. I've been working with grad students there since April or May. And the reason I was able to do so is because I met those grad students um, at the conferences last year, even before I even applied to CMU. So again, it's a great way of establishing connections. Um, you can even possibly collaborate with people. So that's how I um, was able to get out this publication and work on these projects um, so soon. How did you start with your first URA? Right, the first, first ones were pretty tough. Uh, you basically have to email a lot of professors and hope that one of them is interested in you. Um, it's usually fine as long as you have decent grades and okay work experience. So as I focused on um, business before, right? So a lot of my previous work experience was business related. However, my third co-op was in data science. So that's actually kind of what sparked my interest in data science and machine learning. And from there, I kind of contacted professors for URA. And then um, after that, that one URA experience um, helped boost my profile. So I was able to get a USRA full-time position with Jesse Hoey and then Pascal Poupart. And those two USRA positions are by far what led to the most um, development of my research experience and skills. But yes, at the beginning, it's pretty tough. You have to try your best to email a lot of professors and convince them to take you. Um, but typically, they're not very picky, especially for URA, which is part-time. So they don't have to devote many resources and time to you. Great. Yeah, no um, so if anybody else has any questions, I think that seems to be it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. I know Stephen did list his contact info. So if I'm sure if Stephen's okay with it, you can get in touch with him and ask him more questions um, about whatever it is that he talked about, whatever it is you are interested in. But um, that's it for our question period with Stephen. And once again, thank you so much for being here with us today, Stephen. Um, those are all our talks for today. Thank you all so much for being here today and spending some time to learn about the possibilities of research in data science. And it really does mean a lot. We hope you learned something and you have takeaways from today's event. Um, thank you so much to Mara, our keynote speaker, Nayef, our first undergraduate speaker, Sarth, our second undergraduate speaker, and Stephen, our closing um, 
speaker for giving your wonderful talks and teaching us all about data science research and how we can get involved. Um, well, thank you all once again, and thanks for being here. This concludes our event. We hope to see you at future events. So bye for now. Yeah, definitely feel free to get in touch if you have any more questions. You can also yeah. find me on Facebook. Um, so feel free to send me a message. Yeah, sorry again for going over the time limit by so much. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Just gonna end the meeting right now. Okay, thanks, bye.